thank you for that <coughs> very kind introduction. And uh, I don't know how this microphone works, but if you have any trouble hearing me, anybody, please, uh, please let me know. Uh, this is a subject that I enjoy working on, even though I revisit it at uh, infrequent intervals. This particular interval lasted about uh, 25 years. I started a book 27 years ago, finished it two years later, and then started the current book in early '04, and uh, and here it is. Um, people occasionally ask me uh, what's changed in the intervening years, and uh, what hasn't changed? Well, when I started that other book, uh, Airbus was a very small, very small player. Another in the long line of European wannabes that governments would throw money at until they got tired of throwing money at a fail, failing enterprise. Um, n now, of course, all these years later, Airbus is the only other big player. Donald Douglas, lucky, long since gone. Um, what hasn't changed, uh, a number of things haven't changed, but mainly the enormity of the risks in this business. Uh, these are what set it apart from, from, from other businesses. Uh, the high risks and also the high costs. Very few of any businesses um, are involved with as many advanced technologies as this one. And, ver and very few um, are involved with, with as many different world business elements. Um, it's really high risk, high cost, low margins, low sh shareholder security. You can't win, you can't break even, and you can't quit, said Jean Persson, who ran Airbus from 1985 until wholly exhausted. He left at the end of 1997. Uh, Pearson is a very exceptional character. He really is the model for what defines uh, the proper sort of leader in this business. He had the vision, the guts, the common sense, and the personal force to persuade people to do his bidding in Toulouse and Hamburg. Um, he had the confidence of the Germans, which not everybody who's run a, one of these enterprises has had. Um, he was also able to persuade not just the people of diverse nationalities to do his bidding, but he was able to persuade very skeptical American airlines to, bought, to buy Airbuses. Uh, Pearson was determined, and he said that Airbus, you know, the little guy, was going to catch Boeing and divide the market. Well, the gallery laughed at that. The fact is, Pearson was counting not only on on, on the, his company to, to do well, gradually to prosper. But he was also counting on Boeing because he had seen that Boeing was coasting on its laurels, um, was taking the airline market for granted, not building new equipment, um, not doing after-sales service the way it had been doing. In other words, uh, ignoring the fundamentals of the trade. Whereas Airbus, in the meantime, was and, and, you know, keeping faith with the fundamentals and um, showing a great deal of determination um, and also beginning to catch up and gradually to uh, overtake Boeing. Uh, and um, at that point, it not only overtook Boeing, but it even it even it, it acquired credibility, and in acquiring credibility, it began to um, nudge Boeing aside and, and take the lead. But nothing stays the same in this business for very long. In a period of 18 months, from January 05 to June 06, Airbus tumbled off this comfortable plateau it was sharing with Boeing and fell dramatically. It fell more dramatically and sharply than Boeing had in the 10 years during which Airbus had caught up and even for a while had, had passed Boeing. Um, you may ask, what happened? Well, over, the, over a long period of time, for maybe 20 years or so, Boeing made a number of mistakes and did very few things right. Airbus made very few mistakes, but Boeing survived its mistakes. 
was also got lucky a few times. Um, Airbus made, I would say, three mistakes mm -hmm. and is paying very dearly for them to this day. The first mistake, and in some ways the least serious, I think, was building the A380, the Super Jumbo, which is an airplane that really is too big for today's market. But I don't think this was a major um, program killing mistake because air, airline travel is growing almost exponentially. And both Airbus and Boeing have, have the same figures on that. And so there's going to be a room in the market for this for an airplane this big. It's never going to be a barn burner. It won't be a major success. But with a little luck, I think it will, in the end, break even. And um, um, the problem with the A380 is not so much its size, although that is a problem. The problem was what occurred in Toulouse and Hamburg. It's hard to believe, but the production phase was so completely out of whack that these two entities found themselves using different software systems to install 310 miles of wiring in the airplane. And uh, this forced cancellations. Uh, they were not able to, they had to postpone deliveries. This cost the company tens of millions of dollars and a lot of credibility. Um, they've, they've, they've had to do, do this wiring now in, in the prototypes and in the early in the early uh, models to be delivered. They've had to do it by hand. And you can imagine what a hassle that is and how much time that has wasted. Um, I think, as I said before, the A380 in the end will be a respectable program. There were two larger mistakes. The first and the biggest was replacing Jean Persson with a man named Noël Forjar, who had a lot of hands-on experience, although less so than Persson, but whose main credential really was that he was a pal of, of uh, Jacques Chirac, the French president. Um, and Fourchard was not con content just to be the president of Airbus. He wanted to be a co-chairman of the parent company, EADS, which is located in Paris. Therefore, he spent a lot of his time, far too much actually, in Paris, climbing the greasy pole and, and, and taking steps that he thought would please the people who were running EADS. Um, the third mistake, which is related to this other mistake, was not building, was not protecting its interests in the middle market. Now, a word of explanation. The richest segment of the airline market is the middle market, air, airplanes between 200 and 300 seats. For quite a long time, Boeing dominated on this middle market uh, with the 767 and the 757. Then, under Pearson, uh, Airbus produced the A330-200, which in effect wiped the floor with the 767 and the 757 and, t and took over the middle market. Uh, Boeing wasn't going to let that happen without a struggle, at least the Boeing Commercial Airplane Company in Seattle. Uh, but there was a lot of reluctance within the corporate headquarters to build another airplane. It was a very near thing whether Boeing would build the 787, the so-called Dreamliner, which of course is now a huge success, maybe the biggest success of any airplane program anyone can remember. Um, what Airbus could have done and should have done was build a similar airplane, a state-of-the-art middle market airplane. They had the technology and the people, they could easily have done it. But Noel Forjar didn't want to spend the money because he wanted to show his corporate masters in Paris that he could be relied upon not to invest too heavily in a new airplane program. He didn't invest very heavily in new airplanes. Shareholders don't like them because they bring on, for a period of time, deficits. It's, you know, the phrase in the business is you have to be sporty. And being sporty means betting the company, literally betting the company frequently on a new airplane. Well, <coughs> boards of directors don't enjoy that experience, and they, they know their shareholders don't. So anyway, Forjar was very attuned to all of that. So he, he instead decided to take the A330-200 and, and, um, and give it certain features that would make it more modern and look a little bit more like the 787. 
And he thought because so many of the world's airlines were, were flying the A330-200, uh, he could deliver a, a derivative, a, a, a modernized version of that, bring it, bring it online faster than Boeing could bring online the 787. And because it was a far less expensive vehicle, he could sell it for five or six million dollars a copy less than Boeing would have to charge for the 787. So that was his alleged calculation. That was the argument he used. Well, it didn't fly because, as they say, because not a single airline in the world wanted a, a, a ginned up, souped up um, A330-200. They wanted a state-of-the-art airplane. And Boeing is reaping a huge reward. Um, Airbus, very belatedly, designed a kind of look-alike airplane. They called it the A350. But now, under new leadership, they are going forward with developing that airplane. It won't be ready at the earliest until 2012. Um, so Boeing has, well, you can, it'll, 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 it's uh, 787 will go online uh, mid-summer 08, at least that's the schedule. I think that will slip at least a year. But so in any case, Airbus is four years behind uh, in the middle market right now. Uh, Boeing has sold the 787 out through 2014. An airline that wants to book an order for the airplane now cannot. Uh, so Airbus, if it gets its act together, <coughs> not only designs the airplane, but finds the money to develop it at a, at a serious pace, will be able to begin selling it. And in fact, it already has sold some, uh, even though it's, it's the airline is buying specs, really, rather there isn't anything remotely resembling hardware and won't for quite some time. Um, the really contentious issue between Boeing and Airbus is um, the support that they get from governments. Now, gov now the, the Europeans and the Americans do this very differently, if only because they have to, they have different systems. The Europeans give Airbus what's called launch aid. 33% of the development costs of an airplane program are provided by the member governments. And the formula has it that once one of these airplanes is through the development stage and is being bought by airlines, Airbus has to begin repaying this loan once the airplane begins to make money. In one of its most successful airplanes, its most successful airplane, the A320, Airbus has fully repaid the, the development money. Um, Airbus, whereas Boeing complains about this direct support that Airbus gets, the Europeans counter by saying Boeing gets at least as much help from the United States government uh, in the form of the technologies and, and hardware that Boeing gets from its involvement with Air Force and NASA programs. Now, this issue of, of support is, is now before the World Trade Organization. It's the biggest dispute that the World Trade Organization has ever confronted. The WTO, as it's known, didn't want this, and who can blame them? Uh, Boeing started all this. And it's lawyers, because I know one of, one of the, it's, it's, one of, it's senior lawyer dealing with this sort of thing. It's in fact, told me some time ago that this was a crazy thing to do, because nobody wins a dispute in the WTO. But anyway, there it is. Uh, if I were a lawyer and had to argue this case at the WTO, I'd much rather argue the Airbus case, uh, because it just seems to me uh, implicitly much stronger. For example, let me read something, a report from the Seattle Times about all this, about the indirect support Boeing gets. This is just one of several examples. In January 2006, Dominic Gates, in Seattle Times, cited what he described as a bombshell dropped some months earlier by a group of Boeing engineers working on the 787 program. These engineers, veterans of the B-2 stealth program, told an internal investigator that data from B-2 bomber technical manuals had simply been copied straight into 787 technical specifications. Boeing managers, Gates said, were caught by surprise. We all underestimated the amount of screening we need to do for military technology, said Walt Gillette, head engineer and president for airplane development of the 787. He since retired. 
It is our clear intent to make sure we comply with the law, Gillette said. But Gates wrote, quote, the underlying issue is whether Boeing's plan to outsource high-tech 787 composites manufacturing could put U.S. government technology in the hands of either enemies or potential future economic competitors. Yet Boeing's internal response, he continued, quote, suggests a reverse perspective, that the law is designed to protect military secrets, create barriers to legitimate sharing of commercial technology, which executives see as essential in the globalized aviation marketplace. It's an, ar it's an argument that can be used to support Airbus's contention that U.S. technology flows back and forth between the military and civilian sectors, with Boeing as the main beneficiary. Airbus has another strong argument which it doesn't use for peculiar reasons, and that is that Boeing, the wing on the new Boeing airplane 787 is being built in Japan by the three so-called Japanese heavies, Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, Kawasaki Heavy Industries, and Fuji Heavy Industries. They've been involved with Boeing now since the 767 program, but they've always wanted to build a wing, and they want an increasingly large share of a Boeing airplane. Well, now they've got it. They're building not just the wing, which is the clever part, as the British say, of any airplane, but they're also building a section of the fuselage. Uh, in, in Seattle, of course, there's a, there's a lot of resentment against this. They think that Boeing is farming out uh, technology that really is is, is privileged and, and shouldn't shouldn't be doing this. Um, but I've asked why why Airbus. Oh, and and the point I'm almost ignoring is that these three Japanese companies get direct support from the Japanese government. Now, nobody knows the exact number, but I haven't found anybody who doesn't believe that this support amounts to at least as much as what the European companies get from their governments, at least as much and probably more. Uh, now, query, why doesn't Airbus bring this datum into the, uh, into the, into the, into the uh, WTO process? Fact is, Airbus has a as a minuscule share of the Japanese airline market, but also thinks that Japan Airlines just might buy up to 10 of the A380s, the super jumbos. And, and with that in mind, Airbus is reluctant to offend the Japanese by introducing this issue. Um, the problem is that Airbus has too many moving parts. Um, the people in Toulouse would like see this argument used about the three heavies and, their, and the support they get from the Japanese government. But the fact is it's not in their hands. The moving parts consist of the bureaucracies of the member governments and uh, the leaders themselves of these countries. And most important in this case is the, is the bureaucracy of the European Commission. They seem to have the larger part of control over this. So anyway, it's, it's it's an issue that, isn't, that just won't go away. Um, Boeing got lucky in July uh, 05 because a man named James McNerney, who was then running 3M, agreed to come and take over, take the helm at Boeing as, as chairman and CEO. Boeing had been chasing Jim McNerney for many years, and he always said he wouldn't do it. He was very happy at 3M. And then I guess they made him an offer he couldn't refuse. So, so, so he did it. And the hope was, in many places, well, that Jim McNerney would look at this crazy issue of the, the crazy subsidies fight that his company had kicked off and get together with the Airbus leadership and say, well, let's settle this and get it behind us. But he hasn't done that, and he says he hasn't done it because uh, he can't. He says this is between the governments now, and the companies, it, it, this is an issue that the companies are afflicted with, but they can't seem to uh, move it out of the way. Well, in the period that my book covers, which is 20 years from about 85 to 2005, a major event, if not the major event, was the merger between Boeing and McDonnell Douglas. And that, would, that occurred at the, uh, at the very beginning of 1997. Boeing people, retired and active, were deeply opposed to this merger. I mean, the, Boeing, the people in Seattle in the commercial airplane company. McDonnell Douglas, they saw as a as a predatory, autocratic, corrupt culture, uh, which could, could move aside Boeing's, what they regarded as Boeing's essentially problem-solving culture. Um, 
the McDonnell Douglas people returned Boeing's contempt because they thought that a company that was going to re rely on high risk, uh, high cost, low low return cycle, cyclical industry, an industry that, that lives through cycles, up and down cycles, and they could instead be relying on Uncle Sam, a much more reliable customer, um, didn't understand the business it was in. And, and there was a case for acquiring one of the two biggest defense contractors to provide insulation for the Boeing company against the ups and downs of the commercial airplane business. But the Boeing people in Seattle worried, I think, as, as it turned out correctly, that, um, that there would be problems with, with this new culture, that Boeing would, be, would have a difficult time adjusting to it. And whether it did or not was really going to depend on how well Boeing was led at the, at the top. And it, was, and it wasn't being well led then, in my opinion. And there began to be problems in, with, the, with the Boeing defense bureaucracy. Uh, all of these problems involved McDonnell Douglas people who came into the company. Not a single so-called Boeing heritage person was involved. The major scandal erupted in October '04, and it involved um, the sale, the, the proposed sale of, of um, aerial refueling tankers to the Air, For Air Force. Boeing wanted to sell 767s. Uh, to the Air Force as refueling tankers because they felt that could save the 767 program and they could, they could keep the line open. Uh, so a lot of conniving was done between Boeing and the Air Force. Specifically, the conniving was done by Mike Sears, a very talented chief financial officer at Boeing, and a woman named Darlene Druyan. Um, well, Darlene Druyan had a daughter who by that time was working for Boeing. Uh, she had been helping Boeing for years, and members of her family had jobs. And her daughter had discussed with Mike Sears the prospect of Darlene Druyan joining Boeing when she retired, which she was, which she was on the verge of, of, of doing. Uh, with her help, Boeing was able to eliminate 24 or 26 of the specifications the Air Force wanted for this aerial refueling tanker. And in effect, Boeing was allowed to define and redefine the specifications. Uh, unfortunately for Boeing, John McCain got into this. And there was a period during which he would talk of almost nothing else. And he called it uh, corporate welfare, and he spoke of the Iron Triangle consisting of the Pentagon and, and Congress and the industry. Um, he also said that none of this is going to change until people start going to jail. Well, as it happened, Darlene Drunian did go to jail uh, for nine months. Mike Sears went to jail for four months and was fined two hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars. He could have—he was regarded as, a, as possi possibly the next uh, CEO at Boeing at the, at the time this, this happened. Um, it, I mean, Boeing, because of this event, but other events as well, involving these McDonnell Douglas people who came over, Boeing got a huge black eye. And Jim McNerney, whom I mentioned before, decided he had to do something about it. Harry Stonecipher, who had been running um, Boeing, tried to do something by creating a kind of an, um, an, an ethics uh, code, but he was perceived not long after to having violated the ethics code, and so he had to be gotten rid of. It was a very peculiar event, and I have some sympathy for him because of what happened. But in any case, um, McNerney had a much more ingenious way of dealing with this problem, and I think he, he, may, have, he may have dealt with it. We, we, don't, we don't as yet know. And I read something from the book to describe that. Well, before I do, let me just say that a lot of people wondered, how did this happen? It could have been just Boeing and, and the and Air Force. Um, bureaucrats getting this done. If it happened, George Bush was heavily involved as well, as was Dennis Hastert, the, the Speaker of the House. Uh, Boeing had moved its headquarters to Chicago, and, and, the, and Hastert's district lay just athwart Boeing's new headquarters. Well, 
Bush at this point owed Hastert because Hastert has gotten, gotten the first of his massive tax cuts through a somewhat skeptical House of Representatives. And Hastert wanted this for Boeing. And so Bush decided he needed it. He needed to get it done. So he made Andy Card, his chief of staff, the point man. I mean, Hastert met twice in the Oval Office on this with Bush. So this, this, and, 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 and then they, got, they managed to get the tanker deal into the an $87 billion appropriations um, bill for, for Iraq. So this was, this was major stuff. Anyway, McNerney, what? McNerney, the setting McNerney chose was Boeing's annual leadership retreat. The time was early January 2006, with 260 of the Boeing's top executives gathered in Orlando, Florida. There, Boeing's general counsel, Douglas Bain, who was also a senior vice president until he retired later, delivered a savage indictment of reprehensible behavior routinely practiced. McNerney was in the audience, and Bain, Bain began by saying, as I walked up here, I think I heard Jim McNerney mutter, here comes Dr. Death. No one there was in any doubt about who had staged this show. Was there a culture of wind at any cost? Bain asked his audience. We now know what the cost is. Boeing, he noted, faced possible indictments by U.S. attorneys on both coasts, and the Department of Justice assessment of damages exceeded five billion. Also, Bain added, Boeing could be barred from government defense contracts or denied export licenses for both military and commercial sales. He reported that 15 company vice presidents had been pushed out for various ethical lapses in recent years. I found that to be an astronomically high number, he said. There are some within the prosecutor's offices that believe that Boeing is rotten to the core, Bain said. The U.S. attorney in Los Angeles, he said, is looking at indicting Boeing for violations of the Economic Espionage Act, the Procurement Integrity Act, the False Claims Act, and the Major Frauds Act. The U.S. attorney in Alexandria, Virginia, is looking at indicting us for violation of the conflict of interest laws, and both are looking to throw in a few conspiracy and aiding and abet charges for good measure. These are not zip codes, he said, as he read off the federal prison numbers of Darlene Druyan and Mike Sears. How come in the year 2000 nobody said, should we really be hiring the relatives of our chief procurement officer of the largest customer we have on the defense side? Possible impending penalties, he said, include quote, a, a presumed denial of export licenses, both on the commercial and the government side, as well as loss of security clearances, a possible resuspension on bidding for space contracts, or even total debarment from all government contracts on the defense side. Then he added with three questions. Do we have a culture of silence? <coughs> Where is management throughout this? Is the problem the rank and file, or is the problem us? Well, since that moment, I at least have not seen any newspaper reports of, um, of um, malfeasance on the side of Boeing in its relations with the, uh, with the Pentagon. As I was writing about, uh, Boeing and Airbus gradually became a maturing duopoly. That's no longer the case. Um, Boeing really is, is king of the mountain. Uh, I think there's a chance that they will again become a maturing duopoly, Boeing and Airbus, if only because the air travel world really needs two, two suppliers. Um, the engine companies need it, the airlines need it, and all of us need to have two suppliers competing so as to keep costs in line so that the airlines don't drive up the car. I mean, there, are lot, there are lots of reasons, endless reasons, why it's healthy to have two suppliers. And I think Airbus can come back just the way Boeing came back. Airbus has further to come now, and uh, all that's going to depend on the quality of management. The guy who's running Airbus now, his name is Louis Galois, uh, he, like Pearson, had the respect of the Germans, which is very important. Um, he, and in fact, Pearson knew each other. They both worked at Aerospatial. He also, he also ran the, the French National Railroad, SNCF, and did that very well. So he's not a problem. The problem lies elsewhere. It's this jerry-built corporate structure that they, they, that EADS created some years ago, where the, the major stakeholders are are French and German, and they're mainly interested in 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 their own their own uh, 
companies, really. They're, I mean, so, some of them, it's, it's partly government owned and partly company. And um, they don't seem to have any, any great concern with what becomes of Airbus itself. The French feel as if they invented Airbus and they, they have a proprietary interest. The Germans feel that they have just as strong an interest and just as strong a role. So what, you, what, what we've been getting in recent years is a kind of a replay of this French-German bickering or struggling against each other's, trying to undermine each other's interests. And now we have a woman running the German side um, who would like to improve the Franco-German rapport. And she's been openly supportive of Sarkozy, as has Tony Blair. I mean, there may be a chance that the Germans and the French and the British will begin to become more distinctly, quote, European, unquote. We don't know. We don't know where Sarkozy is going to be, whether he's, whether he's going to be a real European, because he, he, he knows how to talk like a European. But he also is suspected of, of harboring uh, protectionist ideas. He's a, he seems to be in some ways a mercantilist, a throwback to Colbert. So we don't know. The future is going to depend to a great deal on, on what he does, what he thinks, and also what becomes of uh, the British government, because Blair, of course, is leaving. Uh, Gordon Brown, who is an enigma, he's a great bureaucrat, he's an empire builder at the bureaucratic level, but he's not much of a politician. And uh, he may have to have a snap election just while the economy's in good shape. And he may not win that election. I don't, we don't know. The, the, the politics in Europe is, it continues to be very uncertain. And, uh, and it is how all of this plays out, I think, that is going to have, it's going to tell us what we need, a lot of what we need to know about whether Airbus has a very serious future. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. And I guess we uh, still have a couple of minutes for questions now. And I would just like to uh, ask you to uh, to state your names and and please ask a question, but don't uh, don't try to uh, to do a cool lecture here. I think that's appreciated by everybody, and will also allow us to get as many questions as possible into the remaining time. Um, so, no. Well, th thank you very much for the lecture, uh, Noel Latif for the FBA. Uh, to what extent do governments get involved in the sale of Airbus uh, planes? Uh, I remember reading some time ago a uh, newsletter from the uh, uh, French Foreign Ministry, and uh, uh, Chirac was quoted as saying, ambassadors of France, you have a duty to sell French products. Uh, do the European governments actively assist in the sales of, of, of these planes? Yes, they do, and have been for a very long time. And they also get involved in the sales of the engines. Rolls-Royce is heavily involved. Tony Blair is heavily involved in selling Rolls-Royce engines to, to airlines. The Americans never did it until uh, 1995, uh, I guess, at five or six. And um, there was a sale of airplanes to Saudi Arabia. Uh, they needed a lot of airplanes, and Boeing was sure it was, it was in line to get the order. But Clinton was looking ahead to the next election, and McDonnell Douglas was still in play then. It hadn't merged with Boeing. And he was, he was not so concerned with the, elect, the, the, with the electorate in Washington, the state of Washington, as he was with uh, Missouri and Southern California. And so Clinton arranged things so that um, he, inter he intervened with the Saudi government and so that they split the order between Boeing and McDonnell Douglas. That had something to do with the merger, by the way, because the Boeing board, when it met, told its, its then leadership, the company leadership, look, you, we've got to take McDonnell Douglas off the board. This is intolerable. And so, and so ever since then, the Americans have been playing the same game as the Europeans. Now, tell us the story of what happened to the supersonic. Uh, program. The supersonic? Yes. Well, it was decided that it was a non-starter. I mean, it, it, it never uh, made economic sense. No. And it's going to be a long time, I would imagine, from everything I hear before there's a serious supersonic program. But 
Um, I think Airbus has been flirting with the idea of trying to co-opt the Japanese because of the heavy Japanese involvement with Boeing. And, and there's, a, there's a notion, probably not much more than a notion, that Airbus, that the Japanese really want into this business, not just as a major supplier for Boeing, but to be in there on their own. And, uh, and that they would like to leapfrog the current generation in order to do that, because they don't have credibility. Um, and it's hard for the Japanese to suddenly Is anybody build a big airplane. Is anybody planning a uh, supersonic plane now? Well, I think Airbus is toying with the idea of, of doing and doing it with the Japanese. I think the Russians may be toying with it, too. Uh, I asked a lot of questions about whether Boeing and, and um, Airbus would would face some competition from elsewhere. There would, there would be more than just two suppliers. And I was particularly interested in whether the Japanese would go off on their own, because they know, that, you know, they've learned a lot of what they need to know from Boeing. Um, and they're awfully good. I mean, they run the, the most sophisticated transportation system in the world. The combination of that, I mean, they, you know, they, their, their express train system and subways and everything, it's just, it's just amazing. Anyway, uh, the Boeing people all profess to believe that the Japanese will never get into this business on their own because they're too risk averse, their business culture is too conservative. Uh, not everybody agrees with that, but that seems to be the, uh, the consensus, the point. Now, I spent two hours with a former Boeing CEO in a hotel room in Chicago. And, and uh, in those two hours, he took one comment off the record. It was the only off the record comment I heard while I was working on this book. And I, I still don't understand why he did. But when I asked him if there was going to be an Asian Airbus or a competitor to Boeing and, and Airbus, he said the Chinese are going to be there. And then he, he gave me a lot of reasons why the Chinese would be there and how they had the technologies and blah, blah, blah. And, but he took it off the record. But it was, it was interesting. He's a guy who travels a lot and used to run the Boeing company. And so I found that kind of interesting. Yes, I'm, I'm curious. What do you think about the outsourcing? Where would outsourcing these? Where do you see the progression of that? Do you see it by the well, right now, outsourcing is the name of the game, as they say. Whether Boeing is, in the long run, going to uh, profit from the outsourcing it's, being, it's, it's doing, um, we don't know, because it's outsourcing the store, really, in a way, yeah, many yes. would say. That, that's my point. Yeah. Um, but Boeing says, well, we're no longer a producer, we're an integrator. Um, we take all this stuff that comes to us, and we put it together, and nobody else can do that. I say, you sure nobody? He said, well, of course Airbus can do that. They do it too. <laughs> Who else? Well, the Russians know how to do it, but nobody else does. And, that, and uh, well, can't others learn? The Jap now don't ever do it, blah, blah, blah. And, um, but when I ask other questions, and I don't get answers that satisfy me, uh, I, I say, well, if, if you outsource all this stuff, I mean, you, get, you, you might get 10,000 queries in the space of a year from an airline customer about what to do about this, that, or the other with, with one of these high-performance airplanes you're, you're sold. Uh, are you going to be able to answer those questions and do all the after-sales service if you kind of, if you kind of stop making the equipment yourself and, and, uh, and, and, and delegate the responsibility to uh, other players in other countries? And they thought oh, that's not a problem, and because well, we, we we have a reservoir of people, we'll always have this reservoir of people who are in, putting the black boxes together and everything. We'll know how to do that. So I don't know. I can't. I can't really come to grips with the, this question. But I, I must say, I'm. I'm kind of. I, I end. I'm, in the end, I'm kind of 55% skeptical that Boeing's necessarily on the right track. Sir. Going one step further, how will that affect the military uh, 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 production of airplanes? How about uh, how will that outsourcing affect the ability of Boeing to meet military needs, Air Force needs? Well, I don't think I, I don't I don't. As far as I know, Boeing is not embarked on any sort of major outsourcing uh, on the military side. If it is, I mean, I haven't followed that very closely, but I don't think it is. Well, well I know this, 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 this instance of the 
787 is, is, is interesting. But I haven't, I haven't seen any other examples of it. If they give you Japan all this wing technology and fuselage yeah. technology, you in turn might give it to the Chinese, who may have a problem. Yeah, but to, the, to the extent that they would be getting, getting involved with the Chinese at that level. Uh, the fact is, what Boeing has done really with the 787 is turned over a, a great deal of composites. I mean, this wing is being, is, is, it's a composite wing. The Japanese have never built a wing for a big airplane before. And nobody's built a wing made, made of composites for a commercial airliner. They built, the Japanese actually built a wing for us, for a, what was it, F-16 look-alike they were trying to do. And, you know, it crashed on, I think it took off, Two, they built two of them, and they both crashed. Not so. They have to take off, I think. Anyway, <laughs> it's just kind of a sobering, sobering reminder that this is, this isn't all altogether simple. This technology, but anyway, so they've turned over the composites technology to the Japanese, and there are serious people in this industry who know vastly more than I, who feel that whoever whoever is in control of composites technology is going to be who's going, is going to be the dominant player for possibly as long as a century. That's probably an exaggeration, but there are serious people who will say that. People who don't like the outsourcing to the Japanese. And of course in Seattle, the, P the Puget Sound area, you can imagine how they feel about it. As you know, uh, EADS is going through a significant restructuring. There are a lot of labor issues. The labor is not cooperating, et cetera, et cetera. And the dual management structure seems to be totally messed up. And what's your view of the future of the company in, in terms of its ability to function uh, efficiently going forward? And is it just going to be an endless drain on the French and German uh, treasuries? I don't know if there's going to be an endless drain, but the company simply will not be able to function, in my opinion, in the long term, unless it gets rid of this jerry-built structure and develops a different, more conventional corporate structure in which there's a, the capability for unitary management, just the way Boeing is. It's simply not going to, Airbus will not survive, in my opinion, unless it gets rid of this structure. Nor do I think it will survive for very long if it doesn't do it. It's going to have to do it. And Galois knows it. And, you know, the serious, the serious people do know it. But it's just very hard to, to move the mountain, as it were. And yet, what's the potential compromise or resolution of the issue? In your, what's the most probable I don't know. The well, they have to get rid of this business of co-chairman, one French, one right, French and one, one German. What would you envision as a probable outcome? Well, it will take somebody who's universally respected and knows what he's doing. He's not trying to prove anything. He's on the edge of retirement anyway. Galois, and you can have one Airbus figure running the show. He could be he could be both chairman and CEO. Galois, and you could have somebody like Tom Enders doing doing the same thing on the defense side for Airbus EADS. I mean that doesn't seem to be so complicated, and it seems to me to have a certain logic. Andrews, of course, has wanted to have some control over the commercial side, even though he has no experience with commercial airplanes. He's very capable. But again, he's, uh, but like a lot of people who's, who are very capable and have a lot of experience, uh, why, why can't I have, a sh have a, at least some share of the responsibility for the commercial programs? It doesn't make any sense to me, but people are people. Jeff Milton, you touched earlier on on the aircraft engine manufacturers. What's the relationship between the major aircraft manufa engine manufacturers and the airframe manufacturers? Are there any sweetheart deals going on or natural associations? Well, I think Airbus strongly suspects there are sweetheart deals going on between Boeing and GE, and they have reason. Um, I think Airbus is a little paranoid about the Boeing and GE connection. Um, I think uh, GE sells engine is looking is not going to try to um, play Airbus off against uh, Boeing. Although it did that when when what's his name, you know, the great CEO of of uh, GE, that Welch, Jack Welch. Jack Welch. Jack Jack Welch t t really took it amiss when 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 somebody 
bought a Rolls Royce or a Pratt engine instead of a GE engine. He did every his, his best. I have some of that in this book, as a matter of fact. And, and um, Pearson really flattened him at one point on this. And uh, um, but I think that Jack Welch learned something from that experience. And I think that GE has played it pretty straight in Boeing and Airbus since then. And Rolls Royce plays it straight, as far as I can tell. Um, it's a it's a it's a it's a fascinating business. I think the aero engine business. I think it's a little easier than the airframe business. But you probably you sound. I suspect you know something about it. Hmm? Calculated guess. I beg your pardon. A calculated guess. Well, that is to say, you do. <laughs> Well, do, well do, you, do you agree with what I've just said? I just wonder what's going on, um, really. Because there's a French uh, associate, is it Snecma? Yeah, yeah. Snecma. And, and where that tech fits into the game? Well, I mean, it's, 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 a, great, it's a great relationship, uh, Snecma and GE, for, for, for GE. Because I think, I think Snecma does the hot section of the engine. And GE has a slightly controlling interest in the partnership and uh, you know the Ameri the French taxpayers pay for SNECMA and so it's, it's a sort of a great gift to uh, the General Electric Company. Are there questions in the back uh, perhaps? Otherwise we'll, we'll take you again. Okay. Uh, what is your appraisal of the uh, technological prowess of the of the uh, 787? Is it going to be a revolutionary new plane? Uh, they call it a, a game changer, and it, and it and it very well could be. Uh, you know, I've always. I mean, this is. This, I mean, Boeing is a very conservative company, and this is the most revolutionary airplane that any one of the big companies has has tried out, at least since Boeing, the conservative company, went forward with the 747 back in the 60s, uh, or 50s, I guess it was, late 50s. No, I mean, it's, got, it's, it's a largely composite airplane, and uh, uh, it has an interior unlike any uh, that anybody has yet seen on a commercial airplane. And very big windows about which Airbus is skeptical. Um, Airbus wonders whether these windows can can stand the kind of pressure that uh, flying at Mach 0.85, 35,000 feet, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But when you walk into the into the uh, cabin of this airplane, I mean the mock-up, and it's it and it's it's very attractive, and I, and it, and it seems it's 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 a great improvement over anything else. Um, for the passenger, as far as I can see. It's going to be pressurized, I think, at, uh, whereas the current airplanes are pressurized at, um, I think, at 6,000. This will be pressurized at 8. And uh, and, it, and the seats and the economy seats, I, I, the, the mock-up also had two, had the configuration with two, two, two classes, um, first and second, as it were. And I sat back in a way in the back in a second class seat, and I thought it was very comfortable. And you could sit there and look out the window, and this big window, and um, it was. A, I could say, well, this is going to be a different experience. A, a question about control systems. The Airbus, I believe, is not only going to fly by wire but going to fly by computer where there's no backup with hydraulic systems if anything goes wrong. And I think Boeing's been very cautious about this. After all, the military's done this for a long time. Right. But if something goes wrong, they eject. You can't eject from a passenger jet. Uh, and there's no, if the system fails, the aircraft will crash. How is this being considered? Well, I don't think that the the only Airbus I think I can remember that ever had a problem with the fly-by-wire was the test well, flight. Well, not the fly-by-wire, but fly-by-computer and no hydraulic backup. Yeah. Goes yeah. Well, it's a com I mean, it's a computer. There's a computer there that um, that I think, uh, in a sense, controls the the um, 
the fly by wire. Oh, no, this is all true, but the, the latest Airbuses, as I understand it, if anything goes wrong with the, you know, you've got this in, for example, the new Falcon corporate jet, um, but it's still got backup. Um, the, they seem to be heading to complete reliance on the computer and the fly-by-wire with no backup systems if it fails. And I think Boeing has been very cautious about this. I just wondered your, what is your reading about the present uh, situation between Boeing and Airbus on this matter of safety? I don't know that there's any difference. Um, I have asked about this, and I've never gotten any, I would say, serious answers. I don't think the people I've talked to haven't really taken this question very seriously. Boeing, as you point out, has been more cautious. On the other hand, Boeing has gotten away from, from you know, from the from the from the, from the conventional, and uh, has has a kind of fly-by-wire arrangement for the triple seven, I think, and certainly will have it for the seven eight seven. But they'll also have a side stick, and so they're going to have both. Um, but the pilots at the beginning uh, didn't like the fly-by-wire, the American pilots. You know, people tend to, I think, recoil from something as dramatically different as that. But then once they got used to it, I think they like it a lot better. Um, it was almost a generational thing. The older pilots, particularly on American, I mean, Bob Crandall said, America will never fly by it. one of these airbuses with this crazy fly-by-wire system. Well, it is better, there's little question, that pilots experienced in it gradually come around. Yeah. Well, no, the, the real question is simply if you have complete reliance on computers and no backup and your computer system fails, the aircraft will crash. Well, you know a lot more about this than I do, but tell me, what is the backup? in a conventional fly-by-wire airplane. Oh, well, look, you've got hydraulic backup and key systems. That's one, one essential thing. How does that happen? I'm on this, but uh, I have been talking to people about this. My, my aviation experience is uh, archaic, so don't trust me for any knowledge of it. I was hoping that you might be able to uh, uh, enlighten me on the present state. <laughs> Well, I don't pretend to have any technological knowledge or insights. As, been, as I said before, I, I look into this subject once every 27 years. <laughs> and I think it's great fun, but I don't pretend to know much about it, really. Well, I guess uh, it's, it's also known that the planes could land without pilots, for instance. I mean, you don't really yeah. need the pilot exactly. for most most situations. It may just be in, in case of a real emergency or so, and obviously people feel more comfortable when they know that there are two, two guys or three guys sitting in the front. Yeah. Whether that's really better or not, who knows? Uh, but, uh, well, no, they do, they do land them by computer all the way down on ILS and then yeah. it's, no, it's a computer. Right. That's like true. Space shuttle, that's true. Is, yeah. I guess where you also see the, I guess the still the astronauts, but for our practical purposes, it's obviously all computer generated. What happens? But I, I guess we we probably won't be able to resolve that technical issue. <laughs> I, I, I do have perhaps one final question before we I guess go upstairs. Um, because you mentioned China, and on the one hand, you said that there are people who are afraid that the Japanese might uh, might turn over the technology to the to the Chinese. So I, I'm not so sure about I, that. I don't think I, I didn't say that. Uh, no, no. But you said that there were some people who who, who seemed to to indicate that. But in any case, I, I, I probably I don't necessarily see that happening because Japan and China are not necessarily on good terms a lot of times. <laughs> but the Europeans were talking about perhaps uh, uh, setting up a production facility in uh, in. China, mm. and in case that happens, um, and if well, I guess uh, looking at the record of uh, intellectual property protection in China, one might argue uh, that uh, that that is perhaps a risky endeavor. And in 20 years, the Chinese are going to have yeah. a an, an airline production facility yeah. and are going to be the big guys. I think that's what this former Boeing CEO who was talking about. That's what he was thinking about was Airbus and China getting together and uh, Airbus in effect being victimized by China the way some people would say the Japanese are victimizing us or by a Boeing. Um, and uh, I think, you know, Airbus is certainly 
envious of, of, of the relationship Boeing has with the three Japanese heavies, and they may wish to replicate this to the extent they can with the, with the Chinese. Yeah. All right, well, thank you very much for your insights and for your Copies, copies of the book are upstairs, and uh, there's also the reception upstairs. And uh, thank you all for coming to the very fun lecture this evening.